Hi, my name is Ross Miller and welcome to the Speedwell Garage, Parkton's friendliest Studebaker Packard workshop. all antique cars, at least up until the mid-60s and beyond, had drum brakes. Uh, everyone generally has their shorts in a wad trying to convert to disc brakes because they don't understand how drum brakes work, or they have drunk the Kool-Aid that drum brakes aren't any good at all, and that's actually just a lie. Uh, they work quite well, of course they don't have the same capacity as disc brakes, but uh, properly adjusted drum brakes will stop your car just about as fast as the disc brakes will if you have them in decent shape. So I'd like to do a little video here today on inspecting and adjusting disc brakes so you get the performance that you expect and would like out of it. Uh, every car I own happens to have drum brakes and I have no trouble stopping in traffic uh, with any of these cars. It's a matter of uh, knowing how they work, adjusting them properly, and you can have great success with them. Now, if you want to do a disc brake conversion on your car, feel free to do it, but do the mechanics a favor, please, mm -hmm. when you do your disc brake conversion. Please write down on a piece of paper what the heck the components are that were installed on the car, because if you bring, say, a Packard in here with a disc brake conversion, and I put it up on the lift, I'm not going to be able to identify what the components are. I will not be able to service it because I won't be able to order anything for it. So at least if you do a conversion, whether it's on a Packard or any other car, at least document it so the people in the future will know what it is. So before I show you how to adjust brakes, I just want to, we're going to pull the wheel off of this so you can see how they're constructed and it makes things a little bit more obvious. Oh, I have to mention this, <laughs> like have to mention this. Um, we've had a number of cars come through lately with these front wheel bearings uh, drawn up like, were drawn up so tight that I had to get a breaker bar almost to undo the nut. That may be correct on your 19 or 2018 fill in the blank. That is not correct at all for cars of this era. You should be able to no more than hand tight. And uh, usually what I like to do is I, I tighten them up by hand like that, spin the wheel a little bit, make sure everything's seated, back it off, whatever is necessary to align the cotter pin. Uh, these are not made to be drawn up tight and you will in fact ruin your wheel bearings if you do it. That car outside, I all but had to get a breaker bar to loosen this nut. And if the car had driven even 100 miles, the wheel bearings would have been ruined. Hmm. I'm, I'm cheating here this morning. I'm not taking, the, not taking the tire off of the brake drum because I just want to save time just for demonstration purposes. So we give a little bit of a heave here. This is, uh, this is a 1951 Packard, but these the brakes on this car would be typical 
Um, anything that Packard used from about 36 uh, right up through 56. It's actually quite typical of a vast majority of other American cars as well. Uh, Chevrolet and Ford had their own peculiarities, but uh, the basic principles remain the same. So, when you uh, step on the pedal, of course the little, little hydraulic cylinder here goes like that and pushes the shoes out to contact the drum. On a Packard, this front spring, which is usually uh, orange, at least in its original livery, it was, it was orange, the back shoe was usually yellow. The orange spring is ever so slightly weaker than the yellow spring, so that this side comes out first. And what happens then is that this shoe comes out and contacts the drum, which is rotating outside here, and the shoe then wants to follow the drum because it's rubbing on the drum. So you have a friction force pushing the shoe along, which pushes through this adjuster down here, and then that helps to magnify the force that's uh, pushing on what's called the secondary shoe back here. This is the primary shoe. This is the secondary shoe. And then the secondary shoe presses even harder against the drum. And what stops everything from rotating around inside is up here is the anchor pin. So when you are uh, braking, this shoe comes out first, presses, provides some braking force. That braking force is magnified uh, into the second secondary shoe, and you have a very nice, uh, very effective braking situation. So there's a couple things that you want to pay attention to. One is that uh, you want to make sure that you have the lighter spring in front so it comes out first. Otherwise, the shoes, if the rear shoe comes out first and then the front shoe, then everything has to reset itself because everything is going to push up against the anchor pin here eventually anyway. So you want that to come out first. Hmm. Um, if you can't tell you which spring is which anymore because the paint's all gone, you can actually just measure these. You'll find that this is like oh, ten thousandths of an inch thinner than, uh, than the other <laughs> spring. A couple other things I found with long, long experience of driving with drum brakes is that you want to keep your shoes uh, adjusted because what I found is that if you keep your shoes adjusted, which is done down here by this thing that expands as you turn the star wheel, um, if you keep your shoes closely, tightly adjusted to the drums, you get much longer brake shoe life. If you do not bother to keep your shoes adjusted, not only do you have a, a squishy brake pedal, which is quite unsatisfying to drive, uh, the shoes will tend to wear on their corners, and you don't get the nice even wear of the shoes. So these are, I don't know how many miles I have on these babies, but they are wearing very evenly, and so I'm quite pleased about that. Okay, now I have to show you one special feature. Let me turn this over here. Um, let me just show this here. All Packards from the earliest ones with hydraulic brakes all the way through 1954 have this wonderful feature here, uh, and that is that the anchor pin is adjustable. And you say, well, why on earth would you want that to be adjustable? That enables you to center up the shoes inside the drum so that you get really good contact. And that's not an adjustment you have to make very often. You only do that usually when you put brand new shoes on or you have your drums turned. Then you can center up your shoes inside the drum and you get really uh, superior braking action and brake life. So I'm going to show how to do that. There was a, there's a way that's shown in the Packard service manual that is incredibly tedious <laughs> and I don't do that anymore. All right. So I'm going to show you a simpler way to do that. All right, I'm going to just take a minute to just show you how the, the eccentric works, and then we'll, we'll go on later to how to adjust it. So uh, there's, a, there's a big old lock nut here. Mm -hmm. Boy, yeah, which you lock very firmly. Take that off. A, so this is called the, the eccentric a turn. That, yeah, this is the eccentric, and I just want, I'm hoping we can see the eccentric action here. If, if it turns, because I haven't turned this in years. There we go. Now, if you look very closely, you can see that the brake shoes are actually moving up and down as I turn the eccentric. 
and that is that enables you the happy Packard owner to center up your shoes inside the drum for most effective uh, braking action. Now I'm going to show you how to do that without hardly any agony at all. If you're going to own an antique car, you need to own one of these. This is called a brake spoon. It's generally what it's, or a brake adjusting tool, generally known as a spoon. And, uh, oops, let me get the little cover off the back here. Really, you get really intimate with your car. You're very intimate. Yeah. <laughs> spooning with this your is car. <laughs> going spooning. <laughs> and uh, and what this does, it just makes it ever so much easier to adjust your brakes because it comes through the slot in the back and engages with the star wheel. And here, here's the rule of thumb. If you want to make your brakes looser you go down. If you want to make your brakes tighter, you go up, and that's true on all four wheels. Okay. So I'm going to make this a little bit looser so we can go through the whole adjustment procedure. And plus, it'll make it easier for me to put the drum back on right this minute, especially since I've screwed around with this adjustment now. Is there an appropriate number for tightness, or is it just because it seems like you're loosening things. I'm getting nervous because, I mean, I don't trust you. If I had to do that, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, it's tight enough, and I guess that's what this video is about. Well, that's it. <laughs> right now we're just <clears throat> loosening it, which means, which basically just makes this little strut shorter, mm -hmm. makes the shoes come in, it'll make it easier for me to put the drum okay. on. So it's an indeterminate number. All right. I just did it because the tire of the drum is really heavy, and I'm gonna have to push it around to get it on there. <clears throat> so if your brakes are loose, what does the pedal action feel like? Uh, the, the, yes, if your brakes are loose, then the pedal action the pedal will be low to okay. the floor. You have to push it a long way because the cylinder has to come out further to make the shoes reach the drum. And uh, I like the pedals on my car to be set as high as possible so you have instant braking action. You don't have to wait till you get the pedal halfway to the floor before something occurs. And as I mentioned earlier, you'll get much longer shoe life if you keep your, uh, keep your shoes adjusted close. So uh, watch me grunt. Uh, ah, the sound effects are huge, huge assistance. There we go, that wasn't bad. You can tell I can't apply much torque to this nut, just turning it like that. So make sure the bearings are all seated, and then I just loosen it, and the cotter pin holes are there, so it is the nut is only just tight. It's only just enough to keep the wheel from wobbling. Not a lot more than that. And I'll probably get a new cotter pin because that's too much trouble to deal with. put the car up and then we'll go through the whole adjustment procedure here. All right. No, normally, for a normal brake adjustment, you would not have to mess with the eccentric up here. You would just uh, use your brake spoon, use this end works better here, and uh, you would turn the brakes up tight, up tight, uh, until you can't turn the wheel anymore, and then you back, back off until it's just free. But um, for demonstration purposes, I want to show how to set this eccentric up here because it has a really big effect on the braking efficiency. So I'm going to show you how I do that. There's a method in the Packard service manual, and you can spend all afternoon with feeler gauges and getting very frustrated doing it, or you can do it this way, which I've used for the last 30 years with uh, perfect success. So this is the way I do it. First, you adjust the bottom adjuster up until the brakes are dragging very heavily. So that's going to take a moment here. Okay, they're starting to drag. Um, use a little 
drag a little harder than that. Ah, that's a little bit too much. I can just turn it. Now what I've done, uh, what I'm going to do is I've already loosened the, uh, the lock nut here. It's still loose from when we were demonstrating earlier. And now it's very simple. You'll notice that the uh, that this adjusting screw here has a high, it's slightly higher on one side than it is on the other. Generally you want the high side towards the rear of the car. That gives you your initial adjustment. So you don't want the high, the high corner at the front. Start with the high corner at the back. And then we're just gonna turn this adjustment one way and another. See, I turned a little bit that way. Now I really can't even move the wheels. I'll try the other direction. Oh, now I can move the wheel. Try a little bit more. Now it's locked up again. So somewhere between where it locked up to the left and somewhere where it locks up to the right, you know that your shoes are nicely centered inside the drum. Oh, that yeah, was getting very good. Just a little bit at a time. <clears throat> and I'd say that I'm there. It's just that simple. Okay. So you're basically feeling the resistance in either direction. I'm feeling the resistance in either direction and I'm minimizing it, which means that the, the shoes are not with one shoulder shoved into the drum over here or one shoulder shoved into the drum over there. They're centered up inside the drum ah, nice. and you'll get, uh, you'll get very good brake performance and very good brake lining life. So then I just tighten up the lock nut, double check that nothing is moved. Then I can go back and finish my normal brake adjustment because this is dragging much too hard, of course. And usually, I like to set mine so I can just hear the shoes just whiffle the drum. In the, that means that there, there's no significant friction going on here. They're just ready to grab it as soon as you hit the brake. So it's whiffling now? That's whiffling. Okay. <laughs> just want to make it's sure. That's what I call whiffling okay. anyway. And we're good. Oh, wow. Yeah, it wasn't that hard. Wow. And uh, you, can do, you can do that at all four wheels. Normally, um, once, you, once you've set this, it's good for the life of the shoes. When you put new shoes on, I recommend that you reset this because the, sh the new shoes might not be perfectly round, uh, the thickness of the lining and such. Uh, they may not be centered up correctly and just a few minutes doing that and you'll be much happier with your brake adjustment. You'll get a very, uh, very firm and very, um, yeah, very effective pedal. Now I'm going to show you uh, some very important things about adjusting the rear brakes that people get wrong. When, when you go to adjust your rear brakes, what you have to keep in mind is that the adjustment of the handbrake has a big effect on the rear brakes. So there's a sequence to do in order to get your rear brake adjustment right. And what I like to do is actually back off the handbrake adjustment, which is done right up here at this equalizer in the middle. It mostly looks like that on most Packards. It can be a little bit different, but what you don't want is for these cables to be pulled tight when you go to make your rear brake adjustment. So, especially if it's an unknown vehicle, the first thing I do is back off this adjustment so that the cables are absolutely slack. If the cables aren't slack when you make your, your rear brake adjustment, what happens is that the, the shoes don't sit nicely on the anchor pin and they will not ride neatly inside the brake drum when you put the brakes on and you'll get much less effective braking at the back. So the first thing to do is loosen these so the cables are slack. You can actually, I can actually feel the the shoes going out to the drum when I pull on the cable, and that's what you want to be able to do. You want to be able to feel the shoes me move, come out to the drum before you do your adjustment. Then you just do your rear adjustment just like normal. This one's already dragging, well, well, just a little bit. Oh, not bad. We'll adjust him anyway, just for video purposes. so I can't move it, and then usually 10 off. That's pretty 
good. We'll go with that. And you, then you do your other side just exactly the same way. What I like to do is uh, pull the cables out by hand until I just feel them contact the, the handbrake mechanism inside. And then I hold the cable still with a pair of ice grips gently. And that has all the slack out of that cable on the right side. And I do the same thing on the cable on this side. And I can just feel it just start to pull the shoes out. Okay, then I adjust the adjustment here until all the slack is out. That's so you pulled it tight for the vice grips on that end so you can adjust here. Yeah. All right, so the slack stops where the vice grips that, are. That's exactly right. All right. You see, I still have, still just moving slack here at this point. What you, what you absolutely don't want is for the handbrake mechanism to be pulling the shoes out at this point. Ah. You absolutely don't want that. It'll make your braking much less efficient at the rear. So this is basically going back to exactly where I had it because it was adjusted properly before. And, the sh and see the cables just, just pull up. They're just a little bit slack and that's fine. Then we try to remember to take your vice grips off. <laughs> Sometimes I don't always succeed in that. Okay. It's, it's important to do your brake adjustment in the, in the right sequence. Get the, get the small adjusters adjusted properly before you do the handbrake. Because what I think typically happens in garages is that the customer would come in and say, my handbrake doesn't hold. And instead of doing the basic adjustment here, <clears throat> they start screwing around with the cables instead and actually this is what needs to be done first because if you keep your the small adjuster on the wheel properly adjusted you never have to touch the cables uh -huh. again but people don't grasp that fact and so they start screwing around with the adjustment here and then they start screwing around with the adjustment here to draw the cable up even further and then when they still can't get the cable if they still can't get the e-brake to work, they put these dreadful little cable shortener things on there, which make a little loop in the cable. And generally the, what's said is, ah, well, the cables stretch. No, mm. the cables never stretch. They may break, but they never stretch. So if you see this on your car, take it off and go. So if, if your car is afflicted with all those, put everything back to a standard position. Afflicted. <laughs> oh my, put everything back to a standard condition, adjust your rear brakes properly, and I guarantee you, you will not need any cable shorteners. All right. All right. We're about ready for a road test, I guess. None of them start like Clippy. done your brake adjustment it's always good to go for a test drive just give them a light touch first see how they're feeling it looks like they're feeling pretty darn good nice and straight all right brace yourself fair enough yep left right or anything it just breaks very nicely no fuss no bother so 
just as a recap, this is a car that has three on the tree. Three on the tree. This and is a car, the overdrive is engaged because the bolt is in. Yes, D. We are actually rolling down this hill in overdrive, so I'm gonna have to use the brakes, but that's okay, because we have good brakes. Now, drum brakes, as I mentioned before, don't have as much capacity for heat absorption as disc brakes do, so they will overheat with time. Long downhills if you ride the brakes all the way down the hill, but back in those days in driver's ed they taught you don't do that <laughs> if you're going down a long hill shift into second let the engine hold you back what happens if the shoe takes on too much heat does it get gummy uh, no what happens is that it loses um, it loses some of its friction ability mm -hmm. and you find for the same amount of braking effort you have to push harder mm -hmm. and harder and eventually if you get them really hot you're pushing very hard and nothing's happening Right. But um, they'll actually give you a lot of warning before that happens. Does the brake fluid get affected at all, temperature-wise? Uh, only in the most extreme situation. Oh, okay. You, you really have to be a buffoon to uh, cause your brake fluid to boil. And if, if you die after that, well, it's your own darn fault. <laughs> so, with the tiniest little bit of respect, drum brakes will do just fine. And in, in normal stop-and-go driving, driving around the Baltimore Beltway, whatever, this car will stop as fast as its tires will allow it. Mm. How fast it stops actually has nothing to do with the brakes at that point. It has to do with the coefficient of friction of tires to the road. Because these brakes can bring all four tires to incipient lockup with no problem. It just can't do it 20 times in a row like a disc brake car can. It can do it maybe 10 times in a row. Hmm. I think that's a <coughs> big misconception about brakes well, and tires. Well, it is a big misconception. The, um, in, in certain adverse conditions, yes, disc brakes will, will stop you faster. Oh, right Critters. Now. Critters. But in normal driving situations, these brakes will stop the car as fast as the car is capable of, the tires are capable of. And that's my story, I'm sticking to it. I drive these <laughs> things around the Beltway, I drive them in heavy traffic. And uh, no, I don't, don't tailgate, not to be recommended, driving 4,000 pound objects. Boring. Boring. Okay. We'll just put this away. Yeah.